meet uh, 70 year old US Air Force veteran William Shuttleworth, who last year started a national conversation with his 110 day, 3,000 mile cross country walk from Newburyport to Vandenberg Air Force Base in San Diego. William made the journey to raise money for veterans and to raise awareness about the issues of homelessness and health problems that confront veterans. William uh, will join us to share memorable stories from his incredible adventure accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation here. So all uh, 20, 25 of us or so, let's give a big round of applause to William. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming tonight, folks. Couple things to be corrected. I'm 72. I want to be full disclosure. <laughs> and I didn't get to Vandenberg because it wasn't really wanted to go. I went a little bit further. I went to uh, San Diego uh, to the naval station there and Great. met people at the kissing statue. Have you ever seen the kissing statue in San Diego? It's quite lovely. So my wife told me to take a hike one day and get lost. So I decided to walk out the front door and go to California. No, it wasn't that. Last summer, I had the opportunity of being a camp host in California to, at a state park. I was there for seven months on Malibu Beach, 58 campsites, and I created three for homeless people because California has a large homeless population. Every night and every morning at my picnic table, there were veterans. They were suicidal, they were on drugs, they had no hope. They couldn't get any benefits at all because they didn't have the paperwork, they had no fixed address. My heart ached for them. On the way home, I said, Patty, I'm gonna do something about this. I'm gonna walk across the country to see if I could ignite some spirit on that. She says, well, honey, I don't know if you can do it. And uh, so she did research that tried to prove to me that I couldn't do it. Uh, there's only 43 people that have walked across America. I'm one of them. 22 of them did it in the relay, which doesn't count. You do 100, I do 100. Uh, I'm the second oldest man to ever walk across America. So the odds were against me. So when she said, you can't do it, you're no guy, uh, why, don't you, why don't you walk to Haverhill? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I can do it. So on May 15th, I walked out my front door and I walked 110 days across this country, 3,300 miles. Average of 31 miles a day, 53 was my longest time, mileage one day, I actually did that three times. I took advantage of cool days, long days and kept on walking. I had an event every day. There was never a night that there wasn't some sort of event at a VFW or an American Legion or at a library or town hall at an Elks Club. I thought my walk was going to be a Zen walk across the country and I might shake hands and hug a few veterans along the way. But by the time I got from Newburyport to Haverhill, 13.2 miles, it became a national news story, Fox News. That night it was on nationwide television and I couldn't hide after that. By the time I got to Albany, they, uh, Fox News declared me America's most famous pedestrian. <laughs> and the next week MSN gave me the honor of America's Hero of the Month. And they did that actually twice. I'm the only person that they ever did it twice. I'm very honored by that. I'm honored because it brought a focus to why I walked across the country, and that's really what I want to talk to you about, about now. So, uh, I do a lot, this is my 51st talk since I've been back. And this picture when I show it to kids is the one that they want to come back to because they can't believe an old guy like me once looked like the guy <laughs> on the left. And they said, is that you? Well, that was the day I, I went into the Air Force. So we were all young one time. You probably have pictures like that. That is my backpack, and I had that sign. And as I walked along the country roads in America, people would see that sign and say, OK, I'm supposed to ask you, what's this all about? It weighed 32 pounds. It had everything I needed. It had my kitchen, living room, and bedroom in it. Uh, it weighed 32 pounds. By 4 o'clock in the night, it sometimes felt like it weighed 80 pounds. 
I felt someone snuck up on me and put a cement block in there because uh, a lot of weight. But it was a lovely, lovely package. This is the stuff I carried right there. Tent, backpack, clothes, all that. There's my map. Uh, as you can see, I walked across Massachusetts into New York. Once I got to Canandaigua, New York, I took a, I went south into uh, northwest Pennsylvania, down to Columbus, Ohio. And then once it got to Columbus, it was almost a straight shot across the country until I got to Grand Junction, Colorado. In Grand Junction, I made my only change in my itinerary when I realized that literally between Grand Junction and the next cup of water was 110 miles. So I went south into Utah, but even then, once I got to Blythe, California, I went 78 miles without ever seeing a telephone pole or a human being, except those that followed me. It was tough. So that's my route. My wife says, I can walk across that anytime. <laughs> this is why I walk, folks. Uh, this is really uh, heart rendering to me. I walk to address veteran suicide. You hear the magic number 22 a day. That is, a, that, that is not accurate. Because the numbers that you hear when they say 22 veterans kill themselves every day did not include data from 23 states. It did not include Texas and California, the two states with the highest concentration concentrates of veterans. Five states do not even list suicide as a cause of death for religious and other reasons, so it's underreported. My best estimate, and I've done an awful lot of research on this, is about 50 veterans every day kill themselves, and that number is rising. Let me tell you how, how high it is rising. There are 6,000 soldiers that had died, have now died in Afghanistan, okay? Since the war, 100,000 have come back and taken their life. That's a city about twice the size of Haverhill. That's why I walked. We need to do something about that. I walked for homelessness. There are 62,000 homeless veterans in this country. All I can tell you folks is that they weren't homeless the day they went into the service to serve this country. They came back and were disenfranchised. They, they had health issues, mental health issues, and we lost them. Congress has already given $293 million to stabilize homeless vets. They've had it in their wallets for three years and have only spent money on administration. Not a single dollar has come to build a house for a veteran. And I'll talk about that $293 million later and what we can do about that. My third goal was to address veteran health care. It's a big joke, I have to tell you that. Massachusetts is one of the best. Nationwide, it's terrible. If you file the claim today, Ken, as a veteran, they will not be able to act on it for 568 days. They're hoping you die in the meantime. Imagine that, 568 days, the average, average claim. We, we have to do better than that, folks. Uh, American, I want the same health care plan for veterans that Congress has. Okay, that's my, all right. Now, I love John McCain. In fact, I met John McCain. Uh, and when he had his brain tumor, God bless him, I wanted it. But I want that same health care for everybody that served this country. My fourth goal was I wanted to make sure we elect more vets. In 1970, when I went into the military, 75% of Congress were veterans. Today, it's 8%. From my picture, from my platform, Congress is nothing but a rich country club of narcissistic cupcakes that have no idea what a veteran is and what their needs are. And if it needs, we need to elect veterans to make sure that they hear that voice or men and women that have a heart for veterans. My last goal is I wanted to raise $100,000 to present to the Disabled American Veterans Charitable Trust Fund to support their rehabilitation. I so far have collected 70,000. And I'm hoping that the last 30,000, which you folks can help with, all of that 30,000 will support veterans in this state. I'm allocating it to this state. That's why I ran, that's why I walked. <clears throat> there I am leaving the state of Massachusetts. To leave the state of Massachusetts, I had to go into Florida 
Massachusetts. Ever been to Florida, Massachusetts? It's poorly named. It snowed like hell that day, and I said, Florida, Massachusetts. <laughs> there I am walking into my first state other than Massachusetts. I met Ellen, she worked at a place called Stewart's, which is like a 7-Eleven. She has 18 kids, his, hers, and ours. Seven of them are actively deployed, praying every night that the phone won't ring for bad news. Um, she just hugged me. She was just absolute wonderful, wonderful woman. This was a lovely day. I was walking in this tiny, tiny rural area of New York State, and I came upon this church on Memorial Day Sunday. And the church was completely filled with people. The minister was outside. And he sees me walking toward him. He said, well, what are you doing? I told him I was walking across the country, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, I'm actually more interested in what you're doing. Your church is filled with people, and you're standing outside your church. He said, I'm ashamed to tell you that I'm supposed to give a sermon on veterans today. And he, he said, I haven't got a clue what to say. He said, would you come in and give the sermon? I said, I'll do it under one circumstance, that I get to give the sermon, I pick the songs, and I pick the prayers. He says, it's all yours. These old guys made me look young. They were all World War II veterans that happened to be in attendance that day. Isn't that lovely? <coughs> really lovely. On the way out, now he says, once you get out of town, the church will want you to be the new minister. <laughs> <laughs> This was typical of what I encountered. This was in Arcade, New York, uh, the VFW. Uh, about 150 people came out that night, and all together they donated about oh, eight, eight or nine hundred dollars to vets. Don't forget vets. I met this man in the restaurant. Look how short he is. That's where he and his twin brother uh, in an elementary school in Italy. He came from Italy and was marginalized, like apparently America loves to marginalize immigrants. Uh, named all kinds of bad names that we called Italians in those days, terrible names, you know. Wouldn't let them get jobs. Big sign says no Italians apply. But yet he served this country well during World War II. And for the last 50 years of his life, he was a bus driver in that little town. Isn't that sweet? Look, that's, look, that's what I wore for the first 25 or 30 days. It rained miserably. Rain that I would have prayed for when I got to California. These are two lovely women that served during World War II as nurses. It reminds me, folks, that we can't forget to honor how much contribution women have made to the military and to the defense of our country. In fact, 18% of our current military are women. <clears throat> I want to, want to think about also, uh, we, we give blacks and Hispanics a lot of bad names in our society. Well, 18% of our military is black. Another 18% right now are Hispanic. A large portion of our military are non-white people willing to defend this country. That's why I think when you sign on a dotted line that you're willing to forfeit your life for America, you ought to have a better health care plan than the one they give you. I happened to be here the day that they opened up the National War Memorial in Columbus. John Glenn was behind it. <clears throat> it is spectacular. I was able to cut the ribbon. The guy in the red shirt and the white leaning down, he is actually the commander. He's a one-star general. These guys gather in front of this park every Sunday with a 70-pound pack and go running 15 miles. They wanted me to join them. I said, guys, I've been walking 1,000 miles. <laughs> I did it, though. <laughs> that 15 miles didn't count toward my 3,300 because I ran in a circle. <laughs> but they were good boys. John Kindhart, Roger Kindhart is well named. As you can see, he hasn't missed many meals. <clears throat> but he has a heart the size of Colorado. He called me the day before I came to his town and said, well, I have about 30 guys that want to have breakfast with you. Can you be here at 6 o'clock in the morning? Well, I looked at my calculations, and I got up at 1.30 in the morning so I could walk to the restaurant to be there, and they were there. And we had a lovely time, a lovely time conversation. We all hugged, took pictures, and I took off. 33 miles later, about eight hours, I ran headfirst into a tornado. I have never witnessed a tornado being from New England. It was all ball game for me. 
And I was out in the wilderness. I said, what am I going to do? Roger pulls up. Nine hours later, this big guy gets out of his truck. He says, I'm not even going to F with you. Get in my truck. <laughs> I got in his truck. He took me to his mom's house. And they had a bunker, and she had cinnamon rolls and coffee. We rode the tornado out, and two hours later, Roger dropped me off, and I was on my way across the country. Folks, I met these guardian angels everywhere I went. Let's go back to homelessness. I came to this town one day where they actually were building a, 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 a house for a homeless, disabled vet in one day. At 7 o'clock in the morning, it was a 14 by 20 slab. At 5 o'clock that night, the guy was eating Cheerios at his dining room table. Wow. 200 people in an organization called Two by Fours for Hope collected together and built this home. It cost $22,000. Now let's take that $293 million that's in the wall of the Congress and divide that by the 62,000 homeless vets. We have more than enough money to build a house for a homeless vet if we had the heart and the moral courage to do it. I love that day. If you saw those pictures, each two by four was given to somebody who participated in the building of that the night before, and they could decorate it with prayers or signs or messages of hope. So all that house is filled with these invisible messages of love. Isn't that really special? I met Noah Garfield. He's seven years old and he runs his own uh, snow cone kiosk called Noah's Cones and he uses all of his money to donate to people who need it most. The day that I was there, he raised $1,700 for a six-year-old girl with a brain tumor. The next day, he raised $1,000 and sent it to me for my Vets Don't Forget Vets. It gives you great hope for America's youth, isn't it? Don't forget Noah, you'll see him later. As often as I give this talk, I, I stumble with this. If there's any one reason that made me so appreciative of walking across the country, it was Matt Barnhart. Matt Barnhart saw me on television and waited two and a half hours sitting on the top of his pickup truck along a farmyard, farm, farm road in Kansas waiting for me. He's 33 years old and he's at that picture dying of congestive lung failure. Lung failure that was caused by being ordered to dispose the bombs in Iraq that Saddam Hussein had accumulated. The VA has denied that he was sick. They denied actually when I saw him that he actually was ever in the military and suggested that he had forged his documents. Then they said, well, maybe you had them, but you, we lost them in the fire. I spent most of the day, look at that face. Does that look like a liar to you? Well, by the time I got to San Diego, uh, two good things happened. He had his first baby, and he has medical care. That was worth walking across America, folks. Once I crossed Quincy, Illinois, across the Mississippi River, I put my feet on Route 36, and I wouldn't get off of it for 500 miles. I'm telling you, folks, I got tired of Route 36. <laughs> <clears throat> On Route 36, though, I met Gary. Gary had a, a memorial out in front of his house with the POW flags, and I knocked on the door, and I said, what's this all about? So he took me to this back porch. He got this big collage. He's in the lower right-hand corner of every one of his veterans, that are, family members that are veterans, all the way back to the Spanish-American War, telling these incredible stories, laughing and crying and sweet stories. His wife would come out and say, what's going on here? And he would send her back in, because he actually had not shared some of these stories. You'll, you probably know that. You know, a lot of veterans have not shared stories that they endured in war. Again, sweet day. These were two tremendous guardian angels. Uh, the lady on the left is A.J. Thompson, whose husband died of Agent Orange. She contacted me on the internet, saw me on television, she says, my, my career was in media. I can connect the dots to dot and make sure that we get all the media coverage that you need. And Mike Bowman lost his nephew in Afghanistan, and he says, I'm unhealthy, I can't walk, but I can make sure that I can 
create places for you to sleep every single night along the way. After these two people contacted me, I never stayed in the tent the rest of, of my trip. Between the two of them, I had 72 television interviews, 150 radio interviews, and about 200 news uh, paper articles spreading the word of what we're trying to do for veterans. God bless these people. This flag here represents the 50 veterans that take their lives every day. My camera can't even capture all the flags. Isn't that amazing? In one month, that's how many, how many veterans take their life. You might have heard the American Legion Riders. Uh, they are a group of young cowboys and cowgirls that ride motorcycles for fundraising for anywhere from handicapped children to domestic violence to veterans affairs. On 12 different occasions across the country, they would meet me about a mile or two out of town and escort me into town. But they did more than just escort me into town. <clears throat> they arranged events, they got the fire department, the state police, kids on bicycles. So by the time we got to the center of the town, it was an all-American Norman Rockwell painting of America at its best. I love those guys. They look pretty rough, you know? We I mean, see those leather vests, but they're just cupcakes. You might not ever see this again the rest of your life. You may never again see two men in the same room with two women that served in three wars. World War II, the Korean and the Vietnam War, and they were just as bright as you could imagine. That is a treasure right there. Isn't that a treasure? Sharp, sharp guys. I met Bob in Rifle, Colorado at a very, very well-run uh, uh, veterans nursing home. Uh, Bob is sharing a delightful moment when I ask him how the food was. He says, well, he says, if you really want to know, the food sucks. <laughs> I says, have you told anybody that? He says, no, he says, they'd raise hell with me if I said that. I said, well, they shouldn't, Bob. So I, I went out to the front desk and asked if the director could come down and meet with me. And I said, Bob would like to tell you about, give you uh, uh, a Yelp rating of your restaurant. And Bob reluctantly repeated what I, he had told me. I thought the man was going to fall over. He said, I am ashamed of myself. He said, Bob, you served in two wars. You deserve the best. He says, I'm going to step up my game. I promise you'll never be able to say that again about my place. Isn't that worth walking across America for? You probably have driven over the Rockies or seen them from an airplane. But when you walk over them, folks, it takes your breath away. I walked over Loveland Pass, which is a four feet shy of 12,000 feet. By then, I could walk anywhere. And Vail Pass two days later, which is about 11,000 feet. Fantastic sight. So look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous? Richard Farr, in this picture, you can clearly see his hands are scored by Agent Orange. But what that also doesn't show his brain, his bones, his kidneys are completely failing, and his life is in great jeopardy. Richard won't live much longer. Agent Orange was a chemical that they sprayed on the trees and the jungles in, in Vietnam to defoliate them so we could see the enemies better. We didn't know at the time that it caused that it did. 2.8 million of the people exposed, 400,000 were dead. Last August, Congress finally passed the legislation to give money to those soldier, sailors that were on Navy ships that were sprayed. They were never entitled to funds because, because they were on the ship. They weren't considered Vietnam veterans because they didn't have boots on the ground. Even today, that money has not been released. Most of these guys are dead, including your brother. I met Boots Morgan. He picked me up at my hotel. He wanted to take me out to dinner. Boots flew 32 different airplanes in World War II, but I pray that no one ever gets in a Subaru and goes a mile in his car. <laughs> <laughs> it was hair raising. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about a truck killing me on the highway. I thought Boots was going to kill me. But look how bright he is. Isn't he beautiful? This is again a typical event that I stayed one night and people put me up and we're having conversations about what we're trying to do. 
This is an interesting picture in Vail because that statue is made of, of a piece of the Berlin Wall, the only piece of the Berlin Wall west of the Mississippi. On my hiking boots, you have these uh, pads that we protect the poles. You can see the difference. The one on the top is a brand new one I was putting on. The one on the bottom is one wore out. I wore out five of those. I wore five pairs of shoes. The only danger I ever come close to, hard to believe, are these dogs. You'd think that something else would have got me. Uh, these are feral dogs in Utah that came off of that ridge and charged at me as if I was going to be their morning Egg McMuffin. Hard to believe, but about 12 feet before they lunged at me, a rabbit came out of a hole, spooked, and he took off after that rabbit. I never saw the dogs again. Oh. God was with me that day. When I went through the Utah, I had to go through Monument Valley, which is owned by the Navajos. Now, the Navajos were instrumental in World War II. You might know them about the Navajo code talkers. Well, they don't let anybody on their land without permission. They had a special meeting. I went to their home, smoked a pipe with them, and got permission. And it was quite lovely how they treated me. Uh, and now this is typical of how I spent my day alone. Isn't that a great picture of the desert? This is, this is in Sedona. The guys on the right are the sons of the code talkers that gave me permission to walk across the country. Larry Harper, the guy in the bright yellow shirt on the right, he's a Vietnam Agent Orange survivor who was on vacation and happened to see me along the road. Stopped to talk to me. Well, he was going to go here, going that. But on and off for the next 11 days, Larry would stop and see how I was doing. Bring me breakfast, have coffee, walk with me. So the Navajos were worried that this skinny little old white guy was going to die on their land. And they, they had people come and follow me every 10 miles to make sure I had water and granola bars. And they'd stop and see how I was doing. Isn't that pretty sweet? Yeah. There's another reason I walked across the country. Art Larson is uh, about two days older than I am. You can see he's an amputee. He lost a leg from Agent Orange. Remember, he lost that as a result of something happened 50 years ago. And when I met him in August, he still had zero disability because he was still fighting with a VA to say that it could have been a civilian job that caused that. Oh. Art's getting services today. Here I am in San Diego. I'm arriving in San Diego, that beautiful lady in the right is my wife who flew there to make sure I wasn't going to walk home. <laughs> All the other pic people in that picture are people that took a bus or flew that I met along the country that wanted to walk the last five miles with me, including that boy. Do you remember Noah? And Noah and his mother and his grandmother flew so that they could participate. She felt that he she wanted her grandson to be part of this American hero. There's my son, Tim, in the back. There's my lovely wife, Patty. Uh, it was fantastic to see her after 3,300 miles. You see the hat, 10 million steps. Uh, it was a little over 10 million steps it takes from to walk to Newburyport to San Diego, in case you really wanted to know. <laughs> I'm enjoying the moment in San Diego. It was a big media event. Several hundred people came and walked with me. Uh, again, the American Legion riders escorted me through the entire city. Just like you see on television, how they block off traffic and they go up ahead. It was really, they were total pros. So now, what have I done with myself since then? Well, um, this is our representative in Newburyport, Jim Kelk, of course, with Boots Chenard, who's become a good friend of mine. Boots turned 97 on Christmas Day. He was at Normandy Beach on D-Day. I was able to have a nice presentation at the State House with the governor on Veterans Day and be honored and signaled out. And your Congressman Seth Moulton, who has served four terms in Afghanistan, four, he and I there are in Amesbury at a presentation, and he and I went to Peabody that night. 
speak at Haverhill High School. One on the other side is uh, at Amesbury. These are part of my speaking engagements. I met with our mayor in, in uh, Newburyport. My new project is I want to start a junior ROTC program connected with the uh, Coast Guard. There's only two junior ROT Coast Guard programs in America. Don't you think Newburyport ought to have one? It's the home of the Coast Guards. Are you aware of that? It's going to have one. The guy on the right, Don DeMondi, called me from Florida. He says, I see you. I've been following your walk. Do you know Bobby K. Parker? I said, never heard of him. Well, he's a Bobby K. Parker was the first casualty from Newburyport. Died on November 29th, 1969. He said, do you know him? I said, no. So I went down to City Hall. Nobody had ever heard of Bobby K. Parker. That's how, you give, that's how a dead soldier could soon be forgotten. Uh, at a special town meeting, I had Newburyport commemorate November 29th as Barbie, Bobby K. Parker Day, and they have a nice memorial going up for him. And Don flew up and spent the day with me and put flags and messages and prayer flags on Bobby K. Parker's day. I would invite everybody in this room to go to your hometown if you live in Massachusetts or wherever you live and find out who the first casualty in Vietnam was and make sure that they're honored. They deserve it. Oddly enough, the first casualty in Vietnam and the last casualty in Vietnam were both in Massachusetts. Are you aware of that? Isn't that interesting? Again, more presentations of my walk across the country, my advocacy. Uh, Reach across America, this was on uh, uh, a couple of days before Thanksgiving in Haverhill. You must have had that here in this town too. Uh, this is the check that I was ready to mail to the disabled American veterans and I stopped down the city clerk who is a good friend of mine, Richard Jones, to make sure we commemorate that. Now what I'm doing. I'm very actively involved in creating what I call a third place. I want to talk about the third place because you folks can do that right here in town. Well. Let's talk about the first place. It's your family, your home, right? That's where your first place is. Your second place is, your, is where you go to work. Well, where's the third place where you can go and let your hair down? Be yourself. Is it a golf course, a bar, a church, library, where it could be, right? Well, my research shows a lot of soldiers, veterans my age, don't have much of a home anymore. They could be widowed, alone. They don't have a second place because they're not working. And now what are they doing? Most of them don't have a third place because they've isolated. It's not surprising that the five states with the highest concentration of suicide are Alaska, Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota, and North Dakota. What do they have in common? Isolation. So what I'm trying to do with some of the funds that I'm raising is to create opportunities for veterans to come together for breakfast and lunch to bring them together so they have conversation and community. It's, it's very popular. You could do that right here in this town. I'm advocating for tax relief for all veterans. And when I say all veterans, I, it should not be income based, nor should health care be income based. Develop a model to eliminate veteran homelessness and use that as a petri dish for America. Support local intervention. Now, if you are a veteran and feel suicidal, they give you an 800 number. Would you give your wife or your daughter or your son an 800 number? You would not. You would go right to their house. We could link that 800 number to someone who's well-trained as a volunteer right here in this town to show up and say, look, you're depressed. Let's go have coffee. We'll get some help. And that's an intervention that could prevent the suicides we have. I want more veterans to run for office. I'm writing a, a monthly column on veterans' issues. You can support ways to honor and recognize veterans other than Veterans Day. One of the things that really bugs me is using, like, Memorial Day to sell cars. Memorial Day sale. Forget Memorial Day was to honor dead people, okay? Not to sell cars. We've got to turn that language around. And you can be a liaison for veterans, and I am for struggling. Veterans call me all the time and say, William, I got this issue. Can you help me? And I'm glad. You know, Massachusetts by far has the best services for veterans. Are you aware of that? Each town has a VSO, a veteran service officer. We are good. We can be better. 
So what can you folks do? You can support my GoFundMe campaign and donate to my efforts here in town. The money's raised will go to here. Let me help you find ways to support vets in your business and communities. I've written a letter to Artie T. DeVoulis, wanting a meeting with him, the president of, of Market Basket, to see how he can help with that and what his role is on that. He's a huge employer statewide. You can offer a breakfast or dinner. I'm telling you, when I talk to veterans, what, do you, what would you need most? He says, I'd like to have a dinner. I'd like to have breakfast. Just don't have it on Veterans Day. Boots, the old guy that I showed you, he, he went to five, five different lunches or breakfasts on Veterans Day. He says, I wish they spaced them out. <laughs> and what you can do is to seek diplomacy and restraint and international cooperation to stop needless wars. Now, I can say this because I served during the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was a complete shamble, and it was a useless war that accomplished nothing. We could probably say the same thing for all of our efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq. And let's not do the chest beating that we're doing right now to, to get up arms and go to Iran because of whatever. Make sure that we think about diplomacy. I want to kill Iran with kindness. I want to build hospitals and schools and bridges and opportunities for hope. That is how, what, isn't that what we did after World War II? And who became our greatest ally as a result of that? Yeah. Japan and Germany. So, how to contact me, you can Facebook me or call me. I'm pretty transparent. You can get a hold of me anytime. I'm glad to meet with any group of people, any family member, any VFW, American Legion, vets. Uh, I'm out there and it's my, my, my sincere effort to do this. My newest campaign is to figure out how people live on minimum wage. Anybody here live on $12 an hour? Try it. Well, I was talking to someone who said, well, you don't know what it's like. And I said, well, you know what? It, it pissed me off that he said that, but I went home. He was right. I don't live on $12 an hour. So I went home to tell my wife, I said, Patty, we're going to live on $12 an hour. I'm going to get a job at Market Basket. I'm working at Market Basket 20 hours a week in the deli, in the dairy section. So I multiply that by two in case it was to say it was a 40 hour a week job. Try to build a budget living in Newburyport, Massachusetts on $12 an hour. And you know why most everybody who works on that wage also applies for food stamps and every other subsistence program to make it work, right? And we marginalize these people. I came on the idea when I came into Vail, Colorado. The day I went to Vail, Colorado, I saw seven buses of people coming in, and I asked someone, what is that? Oh, he says, those are day people that come in and keep the town alive. They were the, the cooks at McDonald's, they worked in the hotels, they worked in the service industry, because you can't afford Vail. And I'll tell you, towns in this area are going to be like that if we do not create affordable opportunities. And people are complaining that my, actually my pay raise as of January 1st went up to 12.75. I ain't making money now. So when my wife said, let's go to the movies, $12, said, that's two hours of pay. You want popcorn? That's another half hour of pay. I, I, we don't think in those terms, do we? Most of us don't have to do that. Well. I'm living that life. I know I can walk away from it. Not only is the challenge financially to live on $12 an hour, but it is isn't amazing how people treat you as a $12 an hour employee. Well, I'm a pretty well-educated guy. I was a superintendent of schools for 30 years. I've been to all kinds of colleges and everything, and people come in the stores, and my bosses treat me as if I'm a total moron. You know, it's quite interesting. So that's my new thing. Uh, I don't know if it's the same with Market Basket, but I'm going to get another job at another uh, entry level. I'm going to do three of them and write a big article about it. I know some people have written about it, but it's different, it's different than experiencing it. I'd highly recommend it. <laughs> so that is my walk across the country. I am blessed that I walked 3,300 miles in 110 days, 10 million steps, 14 states, raising $70,000. I have one and a half million people following me and my walk across the country and have built friendships and opportunities of helping veterans and that's really what I want to do. And if we don't have people like you that continue to advocate, 
our veterans are going to get lost because there's so many other initiatives out there that you can get lost in. I'm blessed to say I never had a blister. I never had a pull muscle. It's just amazing how God followed me on this walk. And that's the gift that I have. I'm in good shape for an old guy. So many other veterans have many gifts that I don't have. They're more intelligent. They can do more with computers. They have far more skills than I do. But this is one that I was able to do for veterans, and I'm glad to do it. Thank you. Thank you.